So hello and welcome. I am Dr. Michelle Buell. I am the current president of Division 15 for APA for just a little bit longer. And I wanted to welcome you all to our business meeting for today to discuss our, our, our annual um, business. Uh, this is one of the final events for our three-day virtual conference, and I really appreciate everyone's participation and engagement over the last few days. And I hope that you've enjoyed the presentations, discussions, and just chances, chances to interact with friends and members just as much as I have. So thank you all for being here. Uh, I particularly want to thank Angela Miller and Carla Fioretto, our program chairs, for their work in organizing the program and conducting everything virtually on both Zoom and Remo, along with Wade George, our communication director, as well as Jeff Beaumont, who's provided us some support uh, in terms of operating through uh, Remo. So thanks to you all for that. Oh, and here's our agenda, just so you know where we're headed for today. In previous years, uh, often at the business meeting, we acknowledge and honor those that we have lost that are no longer with us, and this year is no different. Uh, we've lost some luminaries in the field who've contributed to our thinking and intellectual work in a number of ways, but many of us have also experienced other losses as well, including mentors, colleagues, students, family members, and friends who have impacted us uh, in different ways. So in light of this, what I would like to do for this year is for all of us just to take a moment to recognize those that we have lost in the last year and to honor uh, the role that they've played in our, in our lives and the work that we do as Division 15 members. So if you're interested, I invite you to share the names of those we have lost um, and any memory, memories you would like to share in the chat. So I'll give a moment for that if people would like to share and just to honor those that we have lost before we continue. Thank you for that. And if others would like to add names, it could be people from Division 15, but also others who have touched our lives in different ways who are no longer with us. So for the first order of business, we have the approval of the minutes from our previous business meeting in 2020. I would like to move to approve the minutes from last year's business meeting. I'll second. Thank you, and I believe Wade will be sharing something, yes, to uh, for folks who are uh, Division 15 members to register their approval, uh, disapproval, or abstention from approving the minutes from last year. So while those votes are coming in, I'm going to continue forward with our business for today. The first thing that I have for us here is our president's report. And for this year, um, I had the theme of balance and sustainability in mind, even when I, when I was first elected, um, but it seemed particularly fitting as the events of 2020 unfolded, including COVID-19, as well as the greater attention brought to the social and racial inequities uh, in our society, as well as the impact that all of that was having on our personal and professional lives. So first for this, I'd like just take a moment to honor everything that everyone here has done in the past year as members of Division 15, but also as individuals, um, that despite everything going on in the world, that we continued on doing the best that we could uh, as researchers, educators, students, adapting our teaching methods, our ways of connecting, our ways of mentoring, interacting with one another, while also caring for those who are important to us. Uh, this may have included caring for children at home or elsewhere who may have been learning remotely, uh, caring for family and friends who are ill or just isolated and feeling the effects of ongoing events. So it's, it's been a lot, and I think we need to acknowledge that. Um, in making appointments to various committees, I had many people tell me no, that there was just too much going on, they were stretched too thin, and I truly appreciate that. Um, and I think um, it was Paul Schatz in the last day or two who mentioned how important it is to be able to say no and to say no at the right time. Uh, so it certainly is an appropriate response and I certainly understand that. Um, it, that did make me all the more appreciative um, of those of you who were willing to take up different responsibilities and different roles within the division during such a challenging time. So thanks to you for that. 
and just for the continued work of all Division 15 members, whether it's for the division or in the other various roles that you serve in a professional capacity or personal capacity. Um, as Helen noted uh, in her talk yesterday, we as Division 15 are an organization run by volunteers and Wade George. Um, so thank you all. You all make this work possible. Um, so just kind of recognizing that as we're moving forward for today. Um, as educational psychologist, I truly believe that we can speak to so many of the pressing issues of today, including responding to misinformation about many topics, uh, addressing social and racial inequities, and improving teaching and learning for everyone. I've been truly inspired by the, the work I've been hearing about the last few days, uh, particularly from our new members and I really, uh, and our developing scholars, and as well as just the passion that everyone brings to this work. So I just say, wanna say thank you, and I look forward to the continued contributions that we can all make to this world. With all that said, I do wanna report on some of the different activities from this year. Um, kind of notably with the idea of balance and sustainability in mind, I really didn't push forward any major new initiatives I had, as I had kind of originally envisioned. Um, instead, my focus was really on continuing the typical work of Division 15, as well as supporting the continuation of recent initiatives. So just to note a few of the highlights from this past year. I'm uh, thinking about our publications. Uh, the Educational Psychologist with uh, Jeff Green and Lisa uh, Lindenberg Garcia as editors. Um, somehow Lisa's name got left off and I apologize, her first name got left off there and I apologize for that. Um, but I do think it's notable that our impact factor for the Educational Psychologist right now is 9.541. So thank you for all the work the two of you are doing on that journal, as well as for the various um, contributions our members have made. We've had some really interesting special issues lately. I know some additional ones are coming out soon, so please look for that. For the Psychology Today blog, Sarah Kiefer and Ellen Usher have been overseeing that and have had two posts throughout the last year. And the newsletter editor uh, for our newsletter for educational psychologists, Sharon Front Jumbrun, has done a fantastic job. Um, and I'm really excited to see that uh, the student corner section has been added. Um, and just to note that proposals are being accepted. So if students have ideas, things they want to add to the newsletter, I encourage folks to make contributions there. In terms of our policy group and our practice group, both of them put out additional briefs this past year, uh, two from the policy uh, committee, as well as two from the practice committee. And these are shared on our Division 15 website. And Wade also pushes those out uh, via the listserv and a, a number of different outlets as well. So thanks to those groups. In noting some continuations of recent efforts, as um, Helen Rosa presented at our last business meeting, uh, in terms of the idea of changing the Thorndike Career Achievement Award in light of Thorndike's views on uh, eugenics, eugenics as well as women and people of color, uh, that bylaw change was approved. So that career award is now referred to as the Career Achievement Award for Distinguished Psychological Contributions in Education. We are also very excited to have the standing committee on race and diversity, excuse me, the ad hoc committee on race and diversity that was initially established uh, become a standing committee within Division 15. And Jessica Decker Gumby is doing great work there with her group, it was really inspiring and, and uh, informative um, in terms of the two sessions that they presented during this conference. And I look forward to seeing additional sessions at future years, as well as continued work throughout the year. The early career uh, in educational psychology group has also continued forward with a fantastic series of discussions uh, throughout the year using the various remote technologies that we've had. That's very exciting to see. In terms of the new journal in educational psychology focusing on policy and practice, we are very excited uh, to have the inaugural editors selected, uh, Sharon Nichols and Francesca Lopez. And then finally, uh, for this point here, um, last year, Helen had mentioned the idea of having a special research grant opportunity uh, focused on educational research in the time of COVID-19 and civil rights and social justice. Mary McCaslin and Sharon Nich Nichols organized that grant call as well as reviewing all of the applications that came in. And we were very pleased to fund nine different projects under that special grant initiative. And you can see them listed here. Those, um, Projects are also listed on the Division 15, uh, list, uh, Division 15 website. 
So thanks to you all for the work that you're doing. And we're really interested in seeing uh, what comes out of these various projects and what we have to share with our members in the future. In terms of some um, notable new developments, things I um, did do that were a little bit different than what we continued, the continuation of work. Um, one was more of the organization of materials and streamlining of processes, not very exciting, um, but at the same time, I think useful in terms of sustaining us as an organization and making sure we have everything in, in place that we need to be successful as a group. Wade's contract was up for renewal and we have got it on new contracts, so we're not losing Wade anytime soon, which I am very happy about. And then we have some additional proposed bylaw changes. Um, in part, these came out of um, the bylaw change that we were proposing last year when we wanted to change the name of uh, the Career Achievement Award. As part of the bylaw change process, one of the things that we have to do is to send our bylaws and any changes we want to make through uh, APA Legal Counsel. And when we did that last year, they identified a number of things that we needed to address. Um, so last year, we decided, just, let's focus on this one minor, more minor changing of a name, and then we'll go in and start to address some of these bigger issues later on. So now we're at that later on point. Um, so you'll be seeing these come out soon. I just want to kind of briefly highlight them so you know why you're seeing so much when you, you get the uh, materials to vote on the bylaw changes. Um, it, it's going to look like a lot just to be prepared for that. Um, but I wanted to kind of, again, highlight some of the things you're going to be seeing. One is a whole slew of changes suggested by APA Legal Counsel, in part to update our materials so they're actually accurate. Um, some things have changed at the APA level um, in terms of APA central administration that things no longer exist are still in our bylaws. So we wanna get rid of those things. And also they're um, very encouraging in terms of streamlining bylaws to make them um, not as lengthy and dense and to move some things into our policy and procedures manual. So with that said, some of the things you're gonna see reference to are how to go about removing members, removal of executive committee members, what we do when we have a death or resignation on the executive committee, uh, executive committee uh, moving from having a mailed like paper ballot um, to being able to vote on things electronically. Uh, so just to know that that is coming, that'll aid in the um, facilitation of different processes. And again, moving a lot of content from the policy and procedures to, uh, or from the bylaws to the policy and procedures document. And then uh, um, just in addition to allow us to fix typos and little grammatical errors uh, that may have been missed without having to go out to a full vote of membership. So just know, basically these are all just things recommended by APA legal counsel. Another change relates to the alternate for the division representative to APA counsel. Uh, essentially that in the event that a division uh, rep to council can attend a meeting for a particular reason, that an EC member or former rep to council will serve as the alternate. And the rationale here really is that a member of the EC or former rep is best positioned to represent division 15 at APA council. Uh, previously, or the current bylaws read that it would be whoever got the second number of highest votes. Um, so that person hasn't been involved in the EC or hasn't been um, as up to date on things. That's another change that we are including in the proposed bylaw change. One of the bigger pieces that will be coming out in terms of bylaw changes is change, some changes to the executive committee and the different roles on the executive committee. In particular, for the presidential line, we are proposing from that we currently have a four-year presidential line. So vice president, president-elect, president, and past president. The EC is recommending that we return to the traditional three-year presidential line of president-elect, president, and past president. Similarly, for the treasurer line, we're recommending returning to our previous practice of having a three-year treasurer role for one person. Currently, we have a three-year, three-person role where each year the, um, the, the duties and responsibilities change. Uh, so we have a treasurer-elect, treasurer, and then past treasurer. We are moving a lot of um, things that were more, um, are more tedious or more menial um, around in different ways to make the, the role less onerous. We really don't feel that it's necessary to be spreading it across three people. Um, 
And also, as you can see noted on the slide, the treasurer elect and past treasurer are non-voting members. They're, they're participating, but not really having a vote on the EC. Um, so with that in mind, we want to return to that traditional three-year role of treasurer for one person. And again, the rationale is to reduce the time commitment and increase member involvement in the executive committee. These changes also reduce some costs to the division and ultimately provide opportunities for more meaningful engagement from the EC members. So just to be looking for these changes. Just as a reminder of the process, all members and fellows of the division are eligible to vote and a bylaw change does require two thirds of approval of a two third approval of votes. So in the next few months, voting members will receive um, an email explaining the change and the rationale for the change, along with a link to cast their vote. Um, if we don't have a working email for you, we need to send you a paper ballot. So this is my plea to please make sure your email is up to date, that you have an email on file uh, with APA and the division. And this is one of the reasons why we want to include in that bylaw change for uh, that all votes are reconducted electronically in the future. And then finally, just to note, voting will remain open for 30 days. And with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan Hilbert, our current treasurer for the treasurer's report. So I'm happy to report that Division 15 continues to be in good financial standing. You can see here an account summary. We have roughly 620,000 in checking, 261,000 in short-term investments, another 620 in long-term investments, which includes a mixture of mutual funds and ETFs, and then another 167 in deposit and thousand in deposits and advances. All of that adds up to a total of around 1.7 million, which represents a 12% growth from this time last year. And then so the um, APA division accounting puts a requirement on us that we have twice our annual operating budget. And so we meet that requirement. In 2019, our overall operating expenses were somewhere in the neighborhood of 234,000. And then in 2020, they dropped to 123,000, primarily due to COVID and the virtual conference. And as a result of the fact that we are having another virtual conference this year, our projected annual operating expenses for 2021 are roughly 125,000, the same as they were in 2020. So clearly we are meeting the requirements for, from division accounting to have twice our uh, operating expenses um, on hand. Next slide, Michelle. And then so here you can see a summary of um, our finances. Table one provides a summary of the monies in and monies out where right now we have um, uh, we have 191,465,000 in essentially net profit, but our annual expenses are projected to be around 125,000. So by the end of the year, we should have roughly 66,000 in revenue for 2021. And then table two provides a current account balance. And this is from June and this is year to date. And it just provides a summary of our cash on hand, our short-term investments, receivables, advances and prepaids, and our long-term um, investments. Next slide, Michelle. And then just a couple of updates from the treasurer's office. So first, I wanted to just send a big congratulations to Doug Lombardi, who just finished his, uh, his first year as treasurer-elect, and he will be becoming the treasurer um, during the conference. So once the conference is over, Doug will take over as treasurer and I'll move to past treasurer. And then right now, Gwen Marchand is finishing up as past treasurer. So many thanks to her. She was, she had a successful run through all three of the treasurer lines and she has been invaluable to the treasurer team and we're going to miss her. As far as our business processes are concerned, um, this past year, Wade George and his company, Clamor Inc. have been formally tasked by the EC to help improve our treasurer processes so Wade and Doug have been working together to improve our processes for both disbursements for conference costs. So when we need to be reimbursed as members, they are improving the process by which we can be, we, we get those disbursements. And then also internal monitoring of spending. So they've been working together to improve some of the ways that we um, internally monitor our spending. 
Go ahead, Michelle, next slide. Terrific. And then just some recommendations for the future is the last thing I'll update you on. We would like to move forward with documenting our plan of action for new treasurer procedures as they take shape this year. So as we improve our internal monitoring of spending and we improve our processes for disbursement, we're going to want to make updates to our procedures to make sure that we're documenting that properly. And we want to engage in continued improvement of our business processes and record keeping. You know, Doug and Wade have done a terrific job updating our processes and making things a little easier for the board and for our members. And I think we'll want to continue along those paths. Also, I want to make an announcement that division accounting is now requiring all spending disbursements to be completed within 30 days of the conference end date. So that means that we really have to be on our game when it comes to making sure that we are submitting our disbursements on time. And then finally, the, um, the financial team needs to meet to discuss long-term long -term strategies for rebalancing our investments. Right now, in some ways, we probably have too much money cash on hand and we can think about some ways where we can strategically invest long-term to make sure that we're growing that money properly. And that's all I have to report. Thanks, Michelle. Hi, so I'm Wade George. I'm the D Director of Communications. Um, you likely have a lot of spam in your inbox for me. Um, I'm just going to be going over briefly some of our communications channels. Uh, Michelle, you can advance. So this may be a little bit difficult to read on your screen, but it basically is just an overview of where we stand currently across uh, some of our primary platforms as compared to the previous year. Um, as we take a look at uh, Facebook following, we have seen a slowing of growth in the last two years. Part of that is due to an overhaul that Facebook has undergone uh, in which they have tried to remove as many automated accounts as possible in the last two years. And, uh, and, and a, uh, attempt to combat some of the, uh, the robotic spam um, accounts that exist. And there were some of those that followed us, not a significant amount, as you can see, our, our total has not been um, adjusted too much, but we also experienced a little bit of churn year over year. Um, so while we have experienced some slowing, there is still minor growth there. Um, our Twitter and LinkedIn continue to grow. We do see uh, a little bit of growth in our YouTube video views as well. That was impacted in the past year by the fact that we recorded all of the 2020 APA convention, which was virtual as we have this year. Um, so we do anticipate that video will continue to serve a larger role for us in the uh, near future. Um, for website visits, you can see that uh, we've grown relatively significantly in the past year, uh, almost 50% growth. Uh, 2021 compared to 2020. The website continues to perform well. We have a strong hosting and backup system. Um, it's a very secure system as well, which is not a challenge. Please don't try to bother it. Um, the uh, weekly digest has also seen growth in subscribers in total opens um, and has been generally seen as one of the better perks of membership. Uh, we try to use that is a way to unload some of the volume that you would otherwise receive via the listserv. So if there's an opportunity to combine multiple announcements into a single bailing, um, our members do seem to appreciate that. Um, we have seen a, a little bit lower of engagement across the site today blog in the past year. Um, we haven't shared anywhere near the same number of posts we have a few years ago. If you are considering outlets where you'd like to reach the uh, general populace, uh, you know, general education uh, enthusiasts, parents, teachers, please feel free to submit a post. We're happy to get that into production. Um, they should be written as a little bit uh, less formal than you would for pure academia. Um, something that would be applicable to the layperson is, is generally our theme there. Um, the EdPsych job board has also seen a little bit of decrease. It was an unusual year. Uh, obviously with COVID, and I know that many universities had either frozen or stalled some of their hiring practices, we're starting to see a return to normal there, but as our posts go down, so does our volume as well. As a reminder, this is a completely free service. Anyone that is interested in sharing a job post can simply email me with a Word or Pages version of that post, and I'm happy to get it shared. Um, and then anyone is welcome to visit and subscribe to receive all new job posts by email. 
Um, one area that we did grow in this past year is the number of podcast episodes that we shared. Jeff Green is our host for that and has done a tremendous job um, helping us select and, and curate content. He's a fantastic host, obviously he has that voice that's uh, designed for radio, um, as we always say. He is uh, just, just really having very engaging interviews and um, the listens and, and total number of people that we reach keeps going up. So if you haven't given a listen, strongly recommend doing so. Next slide. Membership has held relatively steady in the past few years. Um, we typically end between 1,500 and 1,800 members per year. We do see a significant amount of churn each year because we have this free first year membership initiative. So anyone that has not held membership in the prior year is able to join uh, at no cost. As uh, a perk of that, they also receive free online access to educational psychologists only for the current year. Um, but uh, we get a lot of people who try out our membership. Uh, they connect with us on social media and then either forget or choose not to uh, renew, which is completely fine because while we do enjoy revenue from membership, it's really a, a small portion of our income, um, as you may have seen on John's slides. Um, really what's most important for us is just knowing that we have an impact on the field uh, and that our publications are reaching the right people and that information is going out as, as it should be. Um, so having an opportunity to reach more people via these free memberships actually does help our revenue as well because it changes our impact factor for the journal. Um, just as a reminder, typically as the APA convention ends, renewal is open for the following year. So uh, please, if you uh, have a chance tomorrow, uh, this coming week, please renew for 2022. Um, if you don't, I have to track you down with emails and such. And, it's kind of a pain. So really appreciate anybody who renews early. It does help us allocate resources for the year ahead as well. Um, so it's, it's useful and it helps improve the overall experience for all members. Next slide. Just to go back to the podcast series, um, I'm not gonna read all of the uh, speakers that we had and the guests, but uh, needless to say, it was a tremendous year for the series. We had um, tens of thousands of listens. I, I shared the stats for SoundCloud only but that is also syndicated by iTunes and other platforms, and there are tons and tons of extra listens there. Um, episodes typically range between 30 minutes and 50 minutes, um, and they're just very engaging. It's a very casual, uh, interesting conversation between uh, a leader in the field and, and Jeff and uh, all of these other people who are putting out fantastic research and doing great work. Next slide. We also have our webinar series, which is chaired by Jason Chen and David Morris. Um, we have had one webinar so far with Pat Alexander and Daniel McNamara. Um, and we have two upcoming webinars. Uh, one of them actually is coming up uh, next week. So please register for that, it is completely free. Um, registration is already open on the Division 15 website and an email has been sent from Listserv. Um, we also have another one with Mimi Bong uh, scheduled for October, 2021. Okay, then I am here representing uh, myself, Ananya Mateos, and uh, Sarah Pruitt on behalf of the Graduate Student Seminar. Um, I wanted to introduce you to the 11 wonderful young scholars who participated and who very much represent the future of our field. So we thought a fun game might be for you to try to match uh, the names that you see in front of you to research interests. And you can take just a minute to type them into the chat and you can just, oops, sorry, you can just do number and letter. And I'm gonna give you guys, you know, wait time, 30 seconds to do that. And then I'll tell you the answers. And you can drink if you're getting these right or wrong, depending on how winning you wanna be. Um, so Amber studies teachers' motivational influences within the context of self-determination theory. Um, Erin studies educators' professional vision, which she really uh, showcased at the uh, invited session today. Uh, Hyeon Lee studies self-regulation of cognition and metacognition during multiple text use. Al Lee studies the reciprocal relationship between students' motivation and goals in the classroom. And Yessi studies underrepresented students' uh, motivation and persistence in higher education. So let's do another round. Here we go. 
And so you can check yourselves. So uh, Precious studies academic disparities among racially and socioeconomically diverse individuals. Crystal studies STEM persistence, particularly among racial and gender diverse individuals. Um, Yvonne is studying, I went out of order. Uh, Yvonne is studying health education and how health kinds of messages are communicated via social media. Uh, Julie is studying self-regulation in higher education, especially for student veterans. Uh, Shing is studying social influences. So for example, parents on math and STEM motivation, and yet is studying bilingual and L2 reading and writing. Um, so hopefully you've seen these students at some of the sessions and you realize kind of what a bright future this division has. Um, and of course, what really made the graduate student seminar so easy for us to organize are all of the wonderful people who said yes and helped us out. And so we want to thank all of the panelists who participated. I'm not going to read names because they were too many, but you can see kind of the caliber of scholars that we were able to get. Um, these are participants in a kind of ask me anything happy hour who were so open about sharing their journeys and trajectories. Oops, I think I skipped one. Yes, this is the other set of panelists on how to find a job. Um, and last but not least, the seminar wouldn't be complete without an outstanding group of mentors who met with students this year for an extended period of time. These were people who were willing to read dissertation abstracts and CVs and send comments ahead of time. And we were just so, so thankful that they were willing and able to give the time and to engage with these young scholars. And so thank you to everybody on the slide and everybody who helped to support the seminar are in kind of a countless number of ways. And that's it for me. So we have this year's presenting award recipients, uh, Kevin Wong for the Paul E. Pintrich Outstanding Dissertation Award, uh, Logan Fiorello for, Fiorella for the Richard E. Snow Award for Early Contributions in the Career, and the Career Achievement Award for Distinguished Psychological Contributions to Education uh, uh, talk was given by Tom Good yesterday, I believe it was. I, I thought all the talks were fantastic and fascinating, and I am always so pleased um, that we record these talks so they're there for us to view in the future to encourage students or others to view as well. So these are the individuals who received the award last year, who presented this year. Um, so next we have the new recipients who will be presenting in 2022. So here we go. Uh, the exciting news for the Paul E. Pintrich Outstanding Dissertation Award, the award goes to Nikki Glover Lubzowski. Uh, so congratulations to Nikki on her work. We look forward to your talk next year. For the Richard E. Snow Award for Early Contributions in the Career goes to Dr. Rebecca Colley. Congratulations to Rebecca. And then the Career Achievement Award for Distinguished Psychological Contributions to Education goes to Daniel Schwartz this year. Congratulations to Dan. So thanks to you all for the fantastic work you're doing. We look forward to hearing about your work next year. And thank you to the committees who reviewed various applications, uh, went through the deliberation process and selected some great award winners who we'll hear from next year. So congratulations to all. And then looking at the chat, I see the congratulations rolling in. So that's fantastic to see and um, keep those congratulations coming. Everyone likes to see that. Next. Also every year, we give out early career research grants uh, to help support the work that individuals are doing, particularly those who are early in their careers. Um, this um, granting opportunity is also overseen by another committee of volunteers, and they were very pleased this year to put forward three names and three projects. Uh, you can see them listed here, uh, Leah Lestard, uh, Kim, uh, excuse me, Kathy Kim, and Rachel, uh, Schoyter, maybe saying that wrong, and I apologize if that's the case. So congratulations on your work, and we look forward to seeing the future presentations that come out of this work as well. So thanks to all for this. And then also, every year, we have a student poster award competition, recognizing two attendees, um, student attendees, who are presenting their work as first author at the Division 15, uh, through the Division 15 program. Uh, so to be eligible for this award, you do need to be attending the annual meeting as a first author who is also a student at the time the poster was submitted and a member of Division 15. So for this year, out of the 161 posters that were accepted into our program, 10 student finalists were selected and then they were featured at our session on Thursday, 
and we have two winners. Uh, so I'm very pleased to present uh, Imogen Rose Herrick on her work uh, with her colleagues through the eyes of a child exploring and engaging uh, elementary students climate conceptions through photo voice and Jessica Kilday along with her uh, mentor Allison Ryan who do students ask for help in class peer characteristics associated with changes in help seeking so congratulations to both Jessica and Imogen excellent work and we look forward to hearing more from you in the future and then this year, we also had an opportunity for an APA wide competition. They asked us to nominate one poster uh, from our current members. And the, um, the, the poster that was selected was by um, Delarama Totanki, uh, along with her colleagues from Old Dominion University, looking at moderators, mediators, and consequences of distinct stereotype threats with black science students. So thank you all for your work. Um, in looking at past slides, we oftentimes also acknowledge our newly selected division fellows. We don't, we, we have a sense of who they should be, uh, but they will not be approved by APA until October 2021. However, I did want to put kind of a, a pause and a moment here to recognize the work of the fellows and the importance for people to put their names forward as fellows. Uh, many of our committees have um, specifications in the bylaws, we have to have a certain number of fellows on those committees. So if you are at that point in your career, I encourage you to put your materials together for to become a Division 15 fellow. If you are already a Division 15 fellow, please encourage your colleagues you think are fellow material to also put their names forward and perhaps offer to write them a letter. Um, so please reach out to your friends and encourage others to become division uh, APA fellows of division 15. And then a recognition to our changing leaders. Uh, we have our outgoing president, Helen Rose Fives, uh, who just is stepping down as past president and chair of the nominations committee, Gwen Marchand, our past president, our past treasurer, Tim Erden, member at large, Megan Ecker, Leister, member at large, and Sharon Zumbrun as the editor for the Division 15 newsletter. Also, uh, Angela Miller and Carla Fioretto as our current program chairs, Clark Chin for the Achievement, a Career Achievement Award Committee, Andrew Elliott for the Snow Award uh, contribution or early career contributions, and Alex List, who is the co-chair of the Graduate Student Seminar, and then uh, Delian Gray stepping down as the co-chair for the Committee on the Development of Early Career Educational Psychologists. So thank you all for your work. Uh, it is certainly appreciated and um, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I also want to welcome our incoming leaders. And this is uh, mainly those who've been appointed to the executive committee. We have Avi Kaplan for president, Beverly Faircloth as president elect, Dion Cross Francis as vice president, Stephen Tonks coming in as treasurer elect and new members at large, Carolyn Wiley and Kelly Rogers. And our program chairs for next year will be Annette Ponick and Courtney Hatton. So welcome all to our incoming leaders. Uh, and I also want to give a welcome uh, to Avi Kaplan specifically, and I know he has uh, some comments that he'd like to share. Thank you very much, Michelle. And um, thank you, the members, for your trust in uh, selecting me to serve you in the role of division president. I wanna take just a couple of minutes to take an opportunity to briefly tell you that my plan for the year as president is to recruit all of you um, and the educational psychology community at large into a process of collective identity exploration about who we are as uh, the educational psychology uh, community and who we want to be. Uh, in her presidential address yesterday, Helen Rose called the state of educational psychology as in an identity crisis. Uh, well, this state is not something completely new. Uh, questions about what educational psychology is and what it should be have persisted throughout um, the over 100 years of the field's existence. Uh, but it also shouldn't be a surprise that this state is heightened in light of the experience over the past two years, the pandemic um, and the growing and long overdue awareness to structural racism. As an identity scholar, uh, I see identity crises and their angst as a natural process of working to adapt to changing circumstances 
as, and, uh, um, as an opportunity for identity reformation. Um, I also know that identity change is most constructive when the person or community is proactive, systematic, um, and takes the time to gather information, reflect, and negotiate the priorities of values, beliefs, and goals, and then consider self-definitions and practices that actualize those values, beliefs, and goals. Um, clearly, identity exploration in our community is already happening, um, and it has intensified in the past couple of years. Our EdSci community is already engaging in important and impactful processes initiated by our previous division presidents and other leaders, such as enhancing the relevance and impact of educational psychology leadership to educational practice and policy, um, and the critical evaluation of the role of race and diversity in ed psych scholarship. Uh, many conversations we listened to in this year's conference reflected such reflection and exploration of what is and what should be educational psychology scholarship and the ed psych field more generally. So what I would like to do is build on and harness these existing valuable directions and conversations, as well as other issues and questions that would come up as pertinent to ed psych as a values informed applied science. And I would like to generate a systematic participatory collective process of reflecting and exploring what they mean to how we as a community want to define educational psychology individually, institutionally, and communally. Uh, so during the next year, I will invite you and other educational psychologists to bring your voice and wisdom and participate in a series of different opportunities to raise and explore central questions about being educational psychologists and who we want educational psychology to become. So I urge you to take them on these opportunities and encourage others to do that as well. And I look forward to collaborating, learning and changing with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Avi. I think we all look forward to your leadership for next year and what comes out of these discussions and the examination of our identity as an organization. Uh, this is the close of our business hour and our time together in this Zoom meeting. Um, so I do wanna note that now we move to our, our social time for the night. Uh, so for our closing social hour, um, we have different op options for you to choose from. And I saw that Wade just posted in the chat the link to our website that has all the individual Zoom rooms that you can join. So we have a sip and pat, excuse me, sip and chat with Pat Alexander, making margaritas and answering random trivia questions with Doug Lombardi, categories with Sharon Zumbra and Christina, uh, Christine Bay and Allison Koenka, Code Names, hosted by Nikki Lobzowski and Amanda Olson, and then Beach Bar Fun, BYOB, with an exclamation point there, by Jonathan Hilbert and Gwen, Gwen Marchand. So I please invite you to join one or several of these different uh, rooms that are opening up next for our social. And then in closing, hopefully we will all see you and be together next year in Minneapolis for APA 2022. So thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. Enjoy the social time. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you so much. Bye.